The entire team at the Emsolation Podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians and cultures of the lands and seas on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders and ancestors. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and stand in solidarity towards a shared future. I personally want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I record this podcast every week, the Wurundjeri people. I recognise their continued connection to the land and waters of this beautiful place I call home. Always was, always will be. This is Free Time Tuesday on M Salation with M Rossiano. Well, hello there and welcome to Free Time Tuesdays on M Salation. I am your spiritual guide, comedian, writer, singer, presenter, neurodivergent M Rossiano. And today you're in for a treat. I sat down with my great mate, comedian Will Anderson. I've been a guest on his podcast, Willosophy, multiple times. I'm equal record holder for the most amount of chats. And this is the first time I have had him on my podcast, but it didn't matter. He kind of took over anyway, and I was happy to go along for the ride. It's a wide-ranging chat. I love talking to him. I don't know anyone else in my life who drills down on the human condition quite like Will Anderson does. He has a book coming out, I'm Not Fine Thanks, available 1st of November. You can also catch him on Question Everything Wednesday nights, 8.30pm on ABC TV and ABC iView. I'm not going to say too much more because this is a long one, but it always is when we get together. Please enjoy Will Anderson. Thank you. It's barely a coffee. It's um. It looks tres milky. Yeah, because I... Um, have run out of anything in the house. Like I haven't been living in this house really and then I'm down in Sydney working and um, so this morning, I've been doing press since, you know, early because it's press day and um, so like, you know, I normally drink a bit of coffee or tea or something, you know, warm liquids to keep talking <laughs> and uh, I had one tea bag left so I had a cup <laughs> of tea and then I was out of coffee pods so I couldn't make a coffee and then I found some old like... Um, yeah, stovetop coffee, like in the back of the cupboard, and it was like enough for about one and a half coffee. So I had a good one before, and now this milky one was the last remaining bit of the stovetop coffee that I could find. <laughs> that like is, so yeah, like it's it's pretty dire. It's pretty sad. Oh, darling, you'll just be <laughs> snorting Nes- Nescafe at some point. If well, you, no, if, if I had it, I would drink it. Like, I'm fine with that. You like, would? I'm not even a coffee snob. I'm like, oh. I love coffee so much that, like, I love <laughs> great coffee. But I also like shit coffee. Coffee to me is like pizza. Like, like <laughs> yes, yesterday on set, like at, at like five o'clock in the afternoon, like mm. I wanted a cup of coffee and like the ABC cafeteria, they normally get me coffee during the day is shut by then. And so someone's gone outside the building and unbeknownst to me, they've gone to Gloria Jeans, which I do not go to because they don't like no. homosexual people. Correct. And Good. so... I philosophically never go there and I'm drinking this like, but it was the only coffee. They, I mean, they didn't run it by us. They just came back with the Gloria Jeans coffee and uh, I was sitting there just going, you know what, even with all the hate that I know was like, you know, supported with this, this is still fine. It's still a good cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Don't hate the player, you, hate the game. You drank the hate coffee because yeah, that, exactly. that's how much you love coffee. Yeah. How many coffees are you having a day, friend? Uh, too many. I mean, it depends if you measure how many cups of coffee I have versus how many shots of coffee I have. Which of those two is your... Shots. Shots. Yeah, I'll probably 12. (gasps) William. Yeah. So I normally have like four or five sort of big lattes, like large lattes in the morning. So your milk coffee too, not just like... I'm not drinking like, you know, short blacks or long blacks or anything like that. I'm talking like proper milk coffee, two or three shots per go. And then I, I so I have my litre and a half of milk and 12 what shots of coffee. And then I just. Do you just hover above the ground and fight? How do you fucking sleep? No, nah, well, you know, this is like part of the balance in your, the yin and the yang. Balance. You know, the balance. balance in your life. The 12 coffee like, a day guy says, oh, this is part of the balance. Yeah, when you're like a, like a you know, func- high functioning stoner like myself. Like, you know, <laughs> is there a t shirt? Is that your merch? I swear to God, if high functioning stoner isn't on a t shirt at your next stand up show, 
Fuck, that's good. I am literally a one-man mission of proving the laser stone a myth a myth because, like, I am so busy and most of it is fueled by me getting stoned and thinking of ideas. So it's all, <laughs> to be honest, starts there. i got to be honest with you. I love you so much. It's been ages. I haven't spoken to you in so long. I think so. I, was, I had I talked to Nazi last week to Nazim, and we're the same. Unless we're working, we don't see each other. So, I've had to force you to come on the pod so I can have a chat with my friend. Oh, I, this is the only way that I you know communicate with people. And often, I to be honest, I don't need to be involved. Like all I ask of my friends is that they start their own podcast, and I can listen to them at my convenience. This is the way I like to consume my friendships. We talk about the danger of parasocial relationships, right? Where people like you know look at celebrities, and we give those celebrities unrealistic expectations. At the moment. When we're talking, you know, there's news, news, I use news in inverted comments about uh, Giselle and uh, Tom Brady. I was just talking about that. Are getting I don't a divorce. want them to... Are they, though? I well, feel like there's just speculation. Who, it's absolutely speculation. Yeah. I've, read, I've read all the stories about it. Me too. It's from a New York, <laughs> like an American tabloid who yep. is basing it on sources close to the couple. Like it's all unverified. It's all and speculation. And she was seen crying on the, a phone call. That it could have been Tom. We don't know, but probably was. And that definitely means that they're getting a divorce, you know? So so we're so invested in this. Although, I, I mean, there is something fascinating by about this dude like, like Tom Brady, who like has played football forever, like has Ever. played longer for than anybody else. He's forty five. Like he's we've forty five. He's old enough to be the dad of most of the guys he plays <laughs> yes. with, right? This is this is the age that Tom Brady is, and he's going yeah. through that classic sixty five year old who's worked the same job. This is like a story that isn't very modern, but in the old days it was very much that idea of like mm. a man in particular would mm. go to work work in the same job for 40 years, yeah. retire at 65, yeah. and then he and his wife would realise they hated each other. <laughs> like the only thing that was keeping their relationship together was the fact that he was out, out of the house 10 hours a day down the mines, right? You think that's why he unretired, because he realised. But isn't that... But when you think of that, you're not thinking about a guy who's literally... 40 days he lasted. Jesus lasted 40 days in the desert. 40 days and 40 nights Jesus lasted in the desert. Tom Brady could couldn't last 40 days at home in a mansion with the world's most beautiful woman. <laughs> like, he was like... <laughs> <laughs> I am done with this. Like, I feel like he's like, you know, he's had a good run with Giselle. This, these have been good years for him. But there's a lot of young, ambitious models who are on the way up, you know, who've just aged yeah. out of Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm talking 25, 26 years old, yes. looking for opportunities for advancement. You know, this is right time for Tom. Although Leo is dating old mate um, Gigi Hadid, who is in her almost 30s. So, yeah, well, then they're not yeah. dating. Can't be true. <laughs> Question everything. Don't believe it well, for a what, second. That's what, what is, why does she want to date him? He's not in great shape. He doesn't seem like the most interesting person. I, I know he helps the environment quite a bit unless she's passionate about that. Like he's, so I, I was looking at those two going, they don't make sense. I understand why a younger woman may do it, you know, different power dynamics and all of that gross stuff, but why would Gigi bother with Leonardo? I don't well, get there it. is something about, like, someone that you grew up with who's that enough older than you that you True. grew up, you know, when you were a teenager, when you were discovering, like, sex and your sexuality, that oh, yeah. they have an intrinsic imprint on your consciousness that, like, they say in, for sex workers, like, if you're work, like, if they're working in, like, a, a situation, like a parlour situation, the music mm. they will play is the music that reminds these men of when they were most virile. So it takes them back to this time when they were like, you know, because they're trying to relive this youth of feeling Jeez. vigorous and attractive and these sort of things. And so it can be a trigger to putting wow. you in that time and space. So I think there's got to be what a... What would I be mean, playing for you then? My husband would have like smashing pumpkins and nine inch mm. nails and Soundgarden. What would you have? Oh, I mean, it would be like a lot of American hip hop and John Farnham's You're the Voice, you know, a bit <laughs> so, of... Just, Whispering Jack would be playing for me if I went to a brothel 100%. For so many different reasons, there's layers <laughs> to that comment and levels. <laughs> but but what I think is also, like, I get that in a way. Mm. Like, there was a... When I was a, a teenager, there was a... Because this is, of course, like, these days when you're, like, a teenager, you know, pornography and the availability of that is, like, all over the place and you can't mm. help but be exposed to the most graphic images of, like, mm. human sexuality, I imagine, by the time that you are in your early teens. You know, with the accessibility that kids have with phones and stuff, I imagine 
that mm. even if you aren't sexually fascinated by it, just that like becoming an adult and seeing things that are shocking and you're not meant to see, I imagine that most kids have like experienced seeing that stuff. But yes. Yeah, when you were my age, like when the only time you saw pornography was like if you found someone on an old railway track that someone had thrown away, you know, like I'm talking... Or SBS World Movies. I remember I, I, I learnt quite a little bit from SBS World Movies. Well, for me, the first time I saw a fully naked woman, like was the first time I saw a fully naked woman. In, right, in right? front of you. Like, right. you know, there wasn't just yeah. a picture of a woman front on, like that you actually kind of understood that it was a three-dimensional sort of thing. But <laughs> yeah. um, so for me, our version of like, you know, discovering your sexuality was there was this poster and it is so imprinted in my teenage mind. There is this poster of a woman playing tennis. <laughs> right? And what? I don't know if people remember this. It was quite a famous poster at the time. And the woman is like in a, like a short white tennis skirt and she's kind of cheeky, cheekily like hitched up the back of her skirt or the back of her skirt has been hitched up and like her buttocks have been exposed. Right. And to me that Hot. like poster was the pure height of human sexuality. There was nothing <laughs> that like, you know, triggered my it. journey from boyhood into manhood more than that particular poster. And then years later, I found out that that woman was Australian and that she lived in Adelaide, I believe, and that Ali McGregor, Adam Hills's partner, yes. uh, that she knew her through some family connection and oh there was God. a possibility that I could probably even meet her if I wanted to meet her. And I was like, no, nope, that's too no, much. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That is a bridge too far. Yeah, that's too much. Because <laughs> just the hint of your cheek used to set me off. It's all oh, I man. thought about. Oh, my God. I would not have been the only one. I imagine she had a generation of young men who thought the same thing. I have to look this up. It sounds like such yeah. an 80s ad too. It's a famous, it's a famous poster. Like, I mean, it, you would you would know, I think you would, maybe you're, you're a bit young. I mean, you're a bit younger than me, so maybe not it's that just. that much. How old are you now? 48 years old. I'm 43. Yeah, but that's enough time. You know, maybe enough. in those five years. Technology changes very quickly. <laughs> maybe there was a big leap in technological advancement between, like, Tennis Lady Girl, <laughs> which was the height of pornography at the time. Yeah. yeah. I just remember my dad had the Chico Roll Girls. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in like in the, he worked in a garage. He didn't look at them, but they were. Oh, mm. I used to go there after school, and the Chico Roll girls would be there on the, the and I'd be like, ah, oh, that's sexy. That's what I need to aspire to. I, need I to, mean, just yeah. like <laughs> I wouldn't want, I'd love to see that woman with the Chico Roll in her hand. Nothing turns me on more than <laughs> indiscernible meat, cabbage. I, I love the idea that someone down at Chico Roll HQ has just been like, okay, we've in, we've invented this. Mystery package. <laughs> this thing that is. We don't know what it is. Halfway between a pasty and a sausage roll, or like and a is dim it a sim? Dim maybe. sim, or is it like a spring roll? Is it a giant yep. spring roll? Well, exactly yep. what is it? So, mm. And they've just gone. How can we sell this? Like, what aspect of this do we lean into down at Chico Roll HQ? And they've thought deep fried know, cock. Yeah, you know, yeah. It just looks a bit like a, <laughs> someone in the office has had to say it first. Like you know, there's always got to be somebody who's like. <laughs> Well, it does look a lot like a cock. Should we lean into that? Like what if... And we... everyone's going, yes, I love that. Right. Yes. So serve it with some meatballs? No. No, I was thinking we'd actually... Don't be vulgar, Derek. Yeah. Okay, we don't want to go that far. What if we put it in the hand of a very beautiful, scantily clad woman? Like we don't say it's a cock. We don't We don't call it the cocko roll or anything. We're not going to lean into it that much. We're literally doing... Just going through the power of suggestion, <laughs> put our <laughs> cock-shaped treat in the hands of a beautiful, scantily clad woman, and hopefully by people just walking into random garages, yeah. they're going to yeah. get a little bit of free subliminal advertising, and they'll just be like, I just got mm. my oil filter changed, <laughs> and for some reason I'm craving a Chico roll. Yeah, but it's also like, do I want cock? Or a deep fried snack. Mm, which yeah. of the two? I love it that, yeah, you're right. I often get sidetracked thinking about how people come up with ideas in meetings. Like, I've just been watching Interview with the Vampire, the new one, mm. and it's amazing. And there's an Australian actor in it. But there's a scene where the vampires levitate. Mm. Two men are having sex and they levitate off the ground and they're spinning while there's sex. And it's just mm. incredible. But someone in the, in the plotting room had to suggest that. And I just wish I could have been there for like, the, and they have to have an intimacy coach and they have to block it out. And I love thinking about the meetings that happen. 
happen around the ridiculous ideas? I mean, not just that, like, somebody had to come up with it because in some ways coming up with it's the easy bit. But as we know, <laughs> yeah. someone had to make it happen. Like well, suddenly there's, you have there's to bike go... seats, seesaws. Right. Like, I saw the behind the scenes of it. It was not sexy. There were sweaty blokes, like, doing this to make them go up and then there's bike seats under their nude yeah. bums with cock socks and it was not hot. <laughs> no, well, this is one of those things where, you know, you think that everybody does the same job. When you think of a chippy, like a carpenter, you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, no, they're like, you know, building houses or like, you know, doing that sort of stuff. But you don't realise that some of them are... Looking Doing up seesaw at, for nude <laughs> slutty gay vampires exactly. to have sex on. <laughs> what did you do at work today, Dad? Yeah. Well, you would not believe it. Knocked up a rig <laughs> for, for two undead to get it on. Do you know Correct. what a cocksock is? Oh, cocksocks, yes. Well, that was like when I when I had a giant self-inflating penis for one of my stand-up yep. tours, I had a set designer and the, the emails would have to go back and forward between us. Do you want it circumcised? Do you want it uncircumcised? Do you want pubic hair? Do you want veins? Mm. And this was his job yeah. to do this. And it was the first one he built. And I wondered if he'd go home and talk about his day at work and the emails about the self-inflating giant penis. And it was just... Yeah, I, I love that idea. You're I mean, right. You know, you know what I like? I, I like that somebody who has that job mm. has an eye for detail. Like they care <laughs> about that job. That's what I'm hearing. That's somebody oh, who's not just going to send you, we've got a standard self-inflating not a roll. Yeah. penis here, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. no, we're going to tailor it to your needs. We're going to specifically was. tailor the penis that you need to it fulfill was. your artistic vision. And it was, thank you for calling it art, yeah. because I did unfurl it in the Sydney Opera House and the it's first art. person to do that and probably the last person to do yeah, it. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a rule were... against that now. They put it in the fine print for shows. <laughs> the, yeah, haven't you got Russiano a show yet? <laughs> Aren't you doing a live record there soon? Like, I'm pretty sure if you read the fine print of your contract, it'll ask you not to bring a giant cock. One so. of my favourite things about uh, performing at the Sydney Opera House, we did our, so I'm doing my philosophy podcast there at the end of the year. So I've had a year yeah. off doing my philosophy podcast for a whole bunch of reasons, but we are going to do two two live shows at the Sydney Opera House as part of the Just for Last Festival, which will be very fun. But we previously did our TOFOP podcast there a few years ago and James Fosdyke, who does all the original artwork, designed us this amazing poster, but mm. it featured the Sydney Opera House. And it turns out in regard to marketing something, even if you're performing at the Sydney Opera House, you are not allowed to use an image of the Sydney Opera House in your marketing. Like that is oh. the trademarked and, you know, it's against the rules. So he solved that by just putting a giant sinkhole where the opera house was <laughs> and the <laughs> opera house just not being there anymore. So Perfect. Good. Yeah. Oh, my God. Now, I'm glad you brought up philosophy. You've done 272 eps. Yeah. I wanted to, I've, I've always wanted to ask you this question. I've been on there a few times. I think, am I still the record holder for most appearances? I think you might be equal most. Sidebar, why don't you do a TV show? You're really good at bringing out the best in your guests. You have an ability because you're so, and you don't lean in. In fact, I would say you do the opposite. You lean out, which causes us to lean into you. And not many interviewers achieve that, but you still, every one of your Willosophy episodes that I've listened to, Every guest has a mini breakdown or confessional or says something they shouldn't. <laughs> like, you just have this ability. I don't know what it is, but you make people want to tell the truth because you have such a high bullshit detector and you are about getting to the truth of things and, and exploring things right to the edges. So we don't want to sit in front of you and bullshit you in any way because we, we want you to like us and we want you to be proud of us. And I think that's a really unique quality and I feel like if you did a show, it wouldn't be about you. It would be about seeing a different side to famous people that we don't normally get to see, which is what your podcast is. Yeah. Like, here's what I, I will say. Like, I, I have been asked a few times. I mean, obviously, the podcast has been reasonably successful. I mean, it still makes the charts, uh, you yeah. know, the podcast charts, and I haven't done a new episode for a year. You know, like, <laughs> you know, people, that's just in the back episode. So, like, it's a popular thing. So when you have something that, as you would know, that has an yeah. audience, there are people who are interested in seeing if they can convert that audience into their audience. Mm. But the truth of it is that it's always been about what would I be giving up to make it as a TV show, right? Yeah, right. Like what would I be gaining versus what would I be giving up? And the thing yeah. that I would be giving up is everything that I love about the podcast, that it can go for as long as I want it to go for, that I can talk about whatever it is that I want to talk about. If, we, if you come on and we talk about the same topic for like an hour and a half, like yeah. then that's like what the podcast is meant to be. It can be mm. one week, it can be about Andy Lee confronting me about the fact that, you know, we'd had like a troublesome relationship to the next week it being just like, 
like an hour and a half of me laughing with one of my friends or it can be mm. Briggs coming in and like telling me some home truths about the way that I see the world. Like it is a very different beast from episode to episode. Mm. So partly there's that. I don't know mm. how I would like... Once you get into a TV you know, situation and you're like, oh, this is how many minutes you have and this is what we want to cover off and this is the clip that they need to play because they're doing this for the plug and blah, mm. blah, 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 blah. And then it just makes it like what happens in those situations is people like once you've got other people involved, yeah. right, you, yeah. need a, you need a safety net. I mostly try to go in with genuine naivety. Like yeah. I, go, I like to go in at the same place that my audience goes in, which is you might not know this person at all and yeah. I'm just going to start talking to them and then I'm going to listen to what they say and based on what they say I'm going to decide what I ask them next. That is literally mm. the way that I do those podcasts. I never have planned questions. There's some standard ones at the end but that's just for funsies at the end to wrap up the podcast. But really it's just me hopefully listening and responding and like mm. trying to create a moment with someone. So... Why do guests come on and feel like they can share something with me? Firstly, I think because I am willing to share something with them. Like mm-hmm. often I will lead with my vulnerabilities around a topic to make them feel comfortable with, you know, ex- like sharing theirs, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that it's not on TV. I genuinely believe part of the reason that people are willing to have that experience with me, there is still a difference between having that when it feels like you're just having a conversation with me that no one else is listening to and doing it in a TV studio where you're suddenly aware of the fact that like a whole bunch of people are going to watch this and they're going to see the way you look and, you know, all these other things that are beyond your control. So the the thing I love about it, I have no interest in like why? Why would I do it on TV? That's that's the question that always comes back to me is like why? Like yeah. if someone could tell me a compelling reason why I would do it on TV, then maybe I would, but I've just never come to that reason where I think this is compelling. I think I would yeah. only be taking something that I love. And this is a project I love so much, philosophy that I've had a year off it because I feel like I'm not in the right headspace to do it. Mm. Like I don't want to do it because I have to do it. Coming up Thursday, M. Rossiano sits down with Chloe Hayden, who plays Quinny on Netflix's reboot of Heartbreak High. I knew from a very early age, I often felt like I'd been sent like from another planet to observe yeah. humans. And from like three, I remember my mum would step on a snail and then I'd be like, but what about its oh, family? Like it's going to be waiting God. for its snail to come home and where does it live yes. and do I need to go and find its house to let it know? And my mum would be like, no, it's fine. Like it's eating the plants, but it's not fine. And then I'd watch the ants and I'd imagine what their houses were like and if they go inside and, like, did they have tiny little chairs and what did they eat? Where did they put the crumbs and how did they carry it? And I would sit there and I'd say all this out loud and everyone would look at me like, what the fuck? Why are we the same person? (laughs) Why are we literally the same person? I have never heard anyone, like, that's so weird. Really? Like, why are we the actual same person? What do you mean? Explain. Like, literally the exact same thing. That was, like, a memory that was, like, back here. Oh. It was in like this much in the back of my head. I have like, you just brought everything up. I'm like, no one has ever spoken about that before. I pushed that back because I thought no one else did that. Oh, I do it. Every single thing that you've said oh. since like when I first walked into this door, I'm like, why are we the same person? Look. This is so weird. Chloe Hayden with M. Rossiano on M. Salation. Thursday morning, 6am, only on Spotify. I think your relentless desire to understand shit and then kind of, I like that you go away and you and you, you really want to get inside something. Then you come back and you just tell people what you think. And you're not saying you're right. It's just what you think. And people desperately want to exist in a binary. Like, but I've found as I got as I've gotten older, especially in my forties, I exist in a non-binary. And I also know, the more I know, the less I know. And I also understand how women, when they get to my age and older, start being accused of being crazy because. You start figuring shit out Mm. and then you get really fucking mad and then you want to talk about it but you're you're considered over 40 and not interesting. But how do you not get, like, do you feel like you're going crazy the more? You're you're one of the smartest people I know. How do you maintain a sense of I'm not losing my mind because you're constantly investigating and and learning shit? And I always think about you and think, how's he... How's his mind not tend in on itself? Do you feel like it's going to happen or how do you stave that off? So I've, uh, this is not me wedging in a plug, but I've written a book. It's called I Am Not Fine, Thanks. And it ex- Good, because I want to wedge the plug in. <laughs> because I said to you, I want to talk about the book. You're like, nah, nah, nah. I'm like, dude... Can we please promote the book? Yeah. So can we please promote the well, book? Well, we, I mean, the book's called I Am Not Fine, Thanks. But the, Good. the, the central premise is 
the idea that absolutely. So for me, and again, this is just me talking about my life. I liked what you said. There's a line in the George Carlin documentary where he says, I'm not telling people what to think. I'm telling people what I think. Yeah. And that is absolutely, if, if there is a misunderstanding from people who don't engage in my work between what they perceive my work to be versus mm. what my work actually is if you spend any time mucking around in it and thinking about it, which is I absolutely come from a place of asking questions and yeah. and, and, and doubt and self-doubt and, yeah. like, it's, it very much is an interrogation of the world and an interrogation of myself and my place in the world is, like, where my work operates because yeah. I don't feel like... If, if you come to me for answers, you've come to the wrong place. The show, would, <laughs> the show would cost three times as much, and there'd be a compulsory, like you know, CD set that you would have to download at the end of it. You know, like I don't have answers. I have questions. Like I'm trying to explore, and I certainly don't think that I've done a good enough job, like with my life, that I'm looking to franchise this shit and tell other people how they should be living their life. But mm. do I think that there is a place in art for expressing what? you are and what you think and being unapologetic about that. Um, yeah. And and that and what I've come to realise as you get older is that that means like revealing your frailties. Like mm. this idea of false bravado, again, it comes to that idea of like the binary, right? People want to see things as being black or white, one thing or the other. And as soon as it gets into this is where a lot of the I think the fear around like, you know, the LGBTIQ community comes from is that that people don't understand, they want things to be binary. They want things to be yeah. yes or no, well, black or white. Nuance is hard you know? work. Nuance right? is, is complicated and hard work and it's much easier, especially the internet doesn't believe in nuance or non-binary. The internet is feast or famine. You're either got to be like riding high or in the fucking depths. No one cares about the middle ground and all the minutiae and the, the beauty of life. So I think, yeah, when, when you, I certainly when I was in commercial radio, they wanted you to like, before or against something and then your co-host had to be the opposing side and it was like I always felt like sometimes I was forced to have an opinion I don't right. even really think I'd formulated. I was 25 for fuck's sake when I first started at SCA and they're trying to make me have opinions about stuff that I didn't really... So I would just say whatever and get myself in trouble and then I'd be like, I don't even really believe that. Like, right. I don't know why... I don't it's know why fine, I fine to be angry. There's plenty to be angry about in the world. Yeah. Like, you know, if you want to... This is... Um, you know, one of the things I've been talking about like, lately is like there's been a lot of people go towards conspiracy theories because in the middle of like a global pandemic, you know, when you are looking for answers, again, mm. there is something that doesn't have simple answers. People mm. wanted masks on, masks off, vaccines, no vaccines. The truth is that these conversations are much more nuanced and people can't like handle the nuance. They want to say there's been a backflip on a ruling or this is a new thing now. Like it doesn't work like that. It's much more no. complex than that. And because we've been promised easy answers from politicians and easy answers from advertisers, we've mm. got used to it. But we're also used to this environment where we can't distinguish things we should be really angry about from things that don't matter at all. And that's yeah. what you're talking about, which is this yeah. false, like, you know, the, I I have three or four good hot takes in me a year. Like, I don't have <laughs> three or four a morning, right? And how do you know what I really care about if you, like, you know, if you're hearing so me true. have the same level of passion about something I don't? And this is what happens in the news. We can't differentiate some Meghan Markle scandal from, like, some climate change report in importance in our brain because they're all presented in exactly the same way. So to ask what happened, for 24 years in a row, I did a show at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, a brand new show every year, and you know how this works. So imagine yeah. you had a practice that you did for 24 years. Like you did this exact same thing at the exact same time for 24 years and your brain got used to this idea of this is how I look at the world in my life and this is how I process the world in my life. I turn it into a show and then I do this show and I get it out of my system and then I start again and I have a look at my life and the world and I write a new show. That was my cycle for almost quarter of a century. Mm -hmm. And then one year it just went away. Mm -hmm. Now you'd love to think that your brain would just be able to take a break from that. But it's not like after you've taught it for 25 years, this is how you work, that it suddenly... So my brain just turned in on itself. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, those that same level of scrutiny 
that I was applying to, you know, normally the, the kind of the broader world and the jobs that I had and the outlet for, you know, me getting rid of that it suddenly was not there. And so it just, I, I said that, um, you know, people were talking to me about shows they were binging at the start. They were like, oh, it's great, I'm binging all these TV shows. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's great. I'm binging every decision I've ever made in my life. That's what <laughs> I've been watching. I've just been doing a little flash forward of every single decision and playing out how those scenarios could have gone differently. And anyway, I'm not really sure I'm invested in this series. I do not <laughs> like the lead character. Is he meant to be sympathetic? I think we should replace him. Is Adam Hills available? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> but what did you come up with? Uh, I mean, you know, I came up with the idea that the one thing that I really kind of like about the book, the book's kind of a bit of a mess in a way, but that was it, it, part of it was intentional, which was I wanted something that felt like the time. You know, mm. there was a point where the book was in linear form. Mm. Like, you know, I literally sort of told, you know, Melbourne Comedy Festival, because the kind of through line is, you know, the Melbourne Comedy Festival goes yep. away and the the end of it is like finally two years later getting back to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. There is that kind of like a through line of narrative yeah. that you could easily just go, this is the way the book can play out. Mm. And then I like just didn't like it like that and I decided to really jumble it around because part of the theme is that time doesn't really make any sense anymore. No. Like, you know, sometimes a week feels like a minute and sometimes a minute feels like a month. Like mm. our sense of when things happened, like it's really hard to identify when exactly something happened. And mm -hmm. and those things all seem so much less relevant at the moment, like what time means. Because also even just that idea of where you're meant to be by here or what this means or like the rights of like graduation, not necessarily at my stage of life but like, you know, you're a kid who's come out of high school or if you're mm -hmm. someone who's graduated university or you're at that point in the career where you were going to turn through, like there, there are these rites of passage ingrained in our society that are markers of time and then suddenly all our sense of time has been out the window. So one of the things that I wanted to try to capture about it was I don't have any firm conclusions. Here are a lot of like things that have occurred to me, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> this is what was going on in my head um, mm. because I, yeah, I don't know. What about you? What do you think? Like what, what I mean, coming, I mean, COVID's over, obviously, um, you know, we've read it in the but paper. It's not, so it must be it's true. not though. What? And that's, it's, it's not over. It's in the over. paper, Em, that COVID was over. Well, it's not over it's and over. this is what's fucking with me the most at the moment is that we're all just kind mm. of like, ah, that didn't happen, lipstick on a pig. Yeah. And, like, the pig is still very much there and needing mm. attention but we're like, nah, I don't want to think about it anymore. It's so boring. Can we just pretend like it never happened? And we're all, like, these traumatised zombies just wondering why the fuck we're sad and angry all the time and I can't sleep. And I came up with... Question everything, name of your show, ABCs, 8.30, Wednesday night. Um, but I now am, like I said, I exist. Someone who knew me, you knew me five, six, ten years ago, she's very opinionated, she knows what she wants, da, da, da. I am now an unsure, hot mess, but I'm a bit happier. Mm. There's less pressure in that. And I feel like I want to understand things more. And I just came up with I need to be gentler, and I need to be more curious and I need to be softer around the edges with everything because no one else seems to be doing that. And it blew up my core beliefs about myself is what the pandemic did in those, those two years at home. And I did initially didn't like what I was and then I understood what I was and now I'm working with that person. And that's where I've ended up. And I love that you've got this book because I feel like, I don't know if you're a Harry Potter fan, but there's a, Dumbledore's able to pull his thoughts out of his head and park them in a little pool and it's like a little reflective pool and if he ever wants to revisit the thoughts, he can pull them out again and pop them in his brain, but it's a way of extracting the sticky thoughts and the memories and I feel like maybe this, this book that you've written, I'm Not Fine Thanks, is your Dumbledore reflective pool for that time. I mean, I think one of the things that was interesting to me is what you just said was I think everybody's life changed, whether they have yes. acknowledged it or not yet. You can't go through something that is such a huge life event and think that it hasn't changed. It might not have popped up yet. It might it be 10 will. years. It It'll fucking haunt you all. If it right. hasn't yet, it will. It, right. And 
there's real life consequences of that, you know, relationships breaking down yes. and like pe- friendships ending and yep. job situations moving on and like all these things that are like integral markers of how we measure our lives here on earth were suddenly mm. like taken away or changed substantially. And it's just not a conversation that I hear us having enough. That is the thing that I would just love us to constantly be, like, you know, from the leaders in the community, the leaders, you know, at the top to be able to go, you, are you, you're cool? Like, we understand. Yeah, you guys, right? There's you guys tectonic cool? shifts. The yeah. plates shifted and we're putting, like, Band-Aids yeah. over the cracks. Yeah, how you doing? Because, like... Yeah. Yeah. We like, went we've all been thing. through something <laughs> yeah. and there's no, all yeah. the therapists are talking to other therapists <laughs> about their concerns. Yeah. So. Are you all fucked too? It's okay if you're fucked. That's normal. Yeah. You're cool, mate. You're good. Go uh, gentle. There's yes. just, you've got, I mean, and so for me it's really interesting because it coincided with I guess my last, um, you know, attachment to the... The real world? Like, you know, mm. I've always been lucky. I'm a bit like you. Like, my career exists, you know, it intersects with the mainstream, but it yes. kind of exists actually on its own outside yep. it. Yes. And, you know, that's the bit of it that I like the most. Then the other Same. bit of it, you know, is the bit that hopefully <laughs> yep. lures the people to the, you know, over to the bit Correct. that I like the most. Yeah. And, but, you know, I, I'd done a big commercial radio job. I'd finished that literally at the end, of, like, you know, of, 2019 and then was going to do like a year of touring. I had three shows I was going to do. I had, you know, all these plans. And Mm. for me, it really, you know, made me think about, okay, when it comes back, you know, like where are you at? Like what Mm. is it that you care about? Like Mm. what is it that you want like to to, like take from this industry but also to give to this industry, Mm -hmm. right? And so part of that, like, that's part of that is what question everything is. Like, it's part of it's meant to be, I wanted a show where, like, you know, with, that it could have that old Good News Week style feel where, like, a, a brand new comedian could come on. Like, mm. Kirstie Wiebeck came on the other night, first time she's ever done a panel show on TV. She was like, great. You know, unreal. Yeah. And she's sitting yeah. alongside, yeah, Matthew Tom Parkinson. Ballard. Oh, Matthew yeah, was amazing. Who hasn't oh done God. comedy for 20 years, you know what I mean? Like, oh, and I just, would see him do stand-up. <laughs> Unreal, he was, right? He was gorgeous. He was so he has such a he was great. He was such a great addition to the panel. And so for me, like to be able to sit there on the panel and look mm. at like Kirsty, you know, mm. who I was giving her first opportunity to be a panelist on TV, to look at Tom, who was actually the first guy who gave Kirsty an opportunity to do stand up on TV on Tonightly, and Paco, mm. someone who was just a legend when I started, who I was watching on the big gig. I'm sitting there with Jan and that panel. And again, we're making something together, right? Mm. And, mm. and I, but I look out at the writers and the interns and the people that we have. We have a rehearsal panel in the afternoon, so we'll get people who aren't necessarily show ready yet, but are younger comedians to come in and like sit on the panel and give their answers. And like that part of the day, I love. Like these were the mm. things I was like, well, oh, this is actually what I love about this mm-hmm. industry. I want to mm-hmm. do more of these things that put me in situations where I can be doing something that I love. Even if I get paid like a fifth of what I get paid to do like a commercial radio job like for it. Mm. Like actually I, I've even gone unders. That's sad. <laughs> I didn't want to make myself feel so, so bad. So I was like a fifth when it's probably more like a tenth. But like <laughs> yeah, you're only lying to yourself, Anderson. <laughs> oh, I'm doing okay. I got the Spotify. I'm all right. <laughs> but it's no, I, 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 I really thought about it. And the, the biggest one, so this is the, again, I'm not sure this is a lesson. This is just a series of events that played out and you can draw your own conclusions from it. But oh, that is your life like, fucking motto. You say that about everything. <laughs> Every, I've, like, I've like rolled around in you in the last few days listening to you on various podcasts and I'm like, this motherfucker doesn't commit to anything. Like, don't try and nail him down. He will float above you and he'll blow your mind but you can't pin it on him. Like, you're Teflon, man. No, Go on. that's not Go no, on. That's not true. <laughs> that is not it true. is. I just... You're just like this like I don't know you you don't really say your political leanings but we know it but that's up to us to draw the conclusion yeah. it's, it's smart my, my, I don't have yeah so I mean that's like you know being again this is like what I talk about when we're talking about definitions of things right mm. like this, as soon as you put a label on what someone's yeah. political leanings are you think that you have a profile of what their political you leanings are I, but I will mm. tell you this like so this is the difference between me and someone who say like 
you know, uh, absolutely you could identify that my politics are not conservative. They are probably <laughs> much further to what people would call the traditional left than even most people that... But really... My politics aren't politics. I don't sign up to a political team and then barrack for everything that they think is a good idea. My yeah. politics are what do I think is important in the world? Who are the people who are addressing the thing that I think is important in the world? Yeah. So if I rank, and I actually say this to people, this is how people should vote. I, don't, I should never tell you how to vote. No. Here's all I ask for you when you vote. Make a list of the things that you genuinely prioritise in your life. If the mm. most important thing in your life is your child's education and you're mm. voting for a party that isn't supporting your child's education, then you've got, you, something's gone wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and so often we vote against our own interests in a way, right? Mm. So I prioritise what I think is important. For me, childcare is a philosophical idea. I, it's great that other people have it, but I don't have kids. So I'm not mm. going to base my vote on like a childcare policy, but I care about climate change very passionately because I live, mm. you know, on the planet. Mm. And, uh, you know, inequality is the biggest one in our society mm. that I think is leading to most of the problems we have. And it is increasing and increasing and increasing. And it's like, so what I tend to do is identify what am I passionate about? The arts, mm. you know, I think mm. the arts is really important. I'm passionate about like comedy and specifically in the arts. Like how can I like do something in these areas that I like or how can I support somebody like politically who is mm. going to try to do something in these areas that I like? But for somebody else, I don't expect somebody else who's like got eight kids and is like a plumber <laughs> worried about blah, blah, blah and lives yeah. in so-and-so for having a completely different set of priorities to me. All I ask of people is identify what you care about, then find out who is doing the best on that and then vote for them. That's all I would ask but of people. No, but it's great and not a criticism of you at all. It's one of my favourite things about you because you're walking the talk. You're encouraging people to exist in the non-binary and ask questions and not just think it has to be black or white. You are living embodiment of that ethos that you put out there. You as a person are like that. Like some would say your association with me is a strange one considering other people's views of me, but... You've taken the time to get to know me and what I'm about and, you know, like you don't nail yourself down to anything because, like you said, you think organised religion's a problem because then you're nailing yourself down to one set of rules but what if you decide something else? Does that mean your whole life gets blown up? So, no, I love that about you but I didn't really think about it until I listened to you concentrated over the last couple of days on a few podcasts and then that's, that's what I realised is one of my favourite things about you is that you do exist in this question everything did you come up with the name of your show? Was yes. that your Yeah, right. Okay. Because that's um, what I would say about you all the time is that that's what you do. So I um, – the story I was going to tell you. I was interrupting so you. Yeah, so what no, did no. you um, – so, say it. What was the thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I think that I probably have chosen stand-up comedy as a career. I think about this a lot. Why did I mm. choose it? Because mm. – the cliche is, because you just said then you don't really, I don't really care what other people think. That's like sometimes the one I thing. Do. I, do you or don't you? Well, sometimes I do, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, of course. Like, I'm a human being. Of course, sometimes yeah. I do. The best bit of advice I ever got on philosophy was from Briggs. He said, why would you take, uh, why would you take criticism from somebody that you would not take advice from? And that, like blew my mind, right? That's really good. Like, you know, because I think it's important to be able to take advice but you should be very careful about the people that you choose to take that advice from. And so it's when I offer advice or if mm. I offer a story like mm. that might – I'm just like, here's a story. Take from yeah. this story what you would like to take from this story. I like but it. I am not start setting out with an agenda of what this story yep. is about. Okay. But here's what I will tell you. So I thought a lot mm. about my stand-up and what I would do with my stand-up when I came back. And I realised that what the pandemic had taught me was – we never knew when the last time we were ever going to be on stage was. I had become mm. used to the idea. You know, I've got another 50 Will Pun titles. Like I, I potentially, say, I potentially could do out. another 50 shows, you know. <laughs> like, and sometimes I do sketch them out in my mind, like rank the titles, <laughs> you know, see how long I think I could actually, you know, sustain an audience to keep Good. going. 50, but, thank God. But I don't think that I have ever honestly written a show that, was a hundred percent. Here is here is who I am, and here is what I think. Right, and so I set out with like well, logical to just write a show for me, 
Mm. Every time that I had a decision to make about whether a bit would go in or stay out, I'd just be like, do you like it? And then I just wouldn't overthink it any more than mm-hmm. that. I'd be like, do you think this and do you like it? And I mm. wanted to write a show that I think is like is where I am and what mm. I am, which is that I like to differentiate the idea between good people and bad people and good ideas and bad ideas because mm. the thing that we find hardest to wrestle with, in my opinion, is that mm. good people can have terrible ideas Mm -hmm. and terrible people can occasionally have good ideas like Mm -hmm. and so that alone prevents us from and we so so often associate like you know so a lot of the the show and 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 a bit of the book is about like moving to the anti-vax capital of australia at the start of a global pandemic and you know what it's like to live in a community where your wisdom is not the prevailing wisdom and Mm. It really, you know, was a lot about that idea of like you can like a person and not necessarily agree with like, you know, the way that they see the world. And to bring that back to philosophy, if I didn't like people because I disagreed with them, Hmm. I I wouldn't like anyone. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Like because I, like if we talk long enough, I'll find something that we fundamentally disagree with and... But I also think that I like people that I disagree with. Like I don't, yeah. you know, I like I'm quite often fascinated by people that I disagree with and I absolutely have a whole bunch of friends who have, like I went and saw, he won't mind me saying this, he likes being mentioned and you can check out this special. It's, I think it's going to I better be on Channel 10 soon or something. But Dave Hughes, I went and saw my friend Dave Hughes. Like, you know, oh, I've known he will Hughesy hear for, this. Yep, he, yeah, both of us. So I've, yeah, known, I've, I've known Husey for, you know, 25 years. Husey and I yeah. have been friends. And, yeah. you know, we worked together on the glass house for a very long time. And yeah. I went and saw his show the night before I taped my show and, like, because we were both in the same venue. And I, like, laughed my ass off, like, consistently for 70 minutes mm. at a whole bunch of things I absolutely did not agree with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, his entire Twitter feed for me was like performance art. Yeah. And I'd be, I would literally have been with him the day before taping something and then I'd read like Old Man of the Sea, Dave Hughes on Twitter, just fucking mm. yelling into the wind. And I'd text him like, mate, are you okay? Because during the day he talked to me about being zen and meditating yeah. <laughs> and then at night he's like gone right wing and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> But also it's like I find that really interesting because some people would hit me up and they'd be like, you know, when are you going to talk to like Dave or when are you going to um, like not be friends? I'm like, man, are you kidding me? Like he's been my friend for like my entire like, you know, comedic adult life. Like he Mm. and I have known each other. Like it's – I don't care. Like, God. Like, he's not out there doing like he's not out no, there no, masturbating I mean, yeah. in front of other younger female comics. He's not Louis CKing no. it. He's just having some fucking wild thoughts. We're all no. angry. Like I got the same thing when I was a like, couple of stuff we did together, and I'm like, whatever, mate. He's not hurting anyone. No. Go, and go most sick. of the time, he's just like you know. He doesn't even believe it, in himself. Calling it as he sees it, or like he's angry <laughs> about something. <laughs> like it's like I mean, yeah. but I do think that. There is definitely a part of me that the prevailing – I think that there was a point in my life where I had aspirations Mm. that I've obviously got to a point in my life that uh, beyond – like, you know, the the aspirations that we all have, right? Like, you know, there is, of course, like you have some success, you would like more success and then there's a point when you're having a bunch of success that you think that maybe the level of success that you can have is infinite, right? Nothing can stop you. I can be on the Mount Rushmore of (laughs) stand-up comedy if there is such a thing, you know? Like there is that thought that, of course, like crosses your mind. But at the moment, the Mount Rushmore of stand-up comedy worldwide isn't really, you know, like a whole bunch of people whose work I'm particularly engaged with is probably the nicest way of saying it. Me too. And it's certainly not the sort of comedy that I am aspiring to. And that's not me saying that that other people shouldn't be able to like or like enjoy or whatever. Like like, like what you like. Like I'm not Mm. that person. Oh, I'll say it. Don't enjoy comedians punching down on black trans women. I'll say it. Get to you. I mean, or at least, anyway, we could talk <laughs> yeah. for hours yeah, about we'll my talk problems hours. with that Let's, special. Yeah. But, like, yeah. but, but the point being that what I'd rather do, what is better than, like I can spend my time debating the various merits of other people's work or mm. 
weirdly enough, I have like a forum in which I can create my own work. Yes. And like my response to that can be in the way that I create my work. So what I really wanted to do was try to balance something where I can be making fun, like, and because that's my job. That is what mm. I paint with, right? I am a mm-hmm. comedian. Like yes. my capacity, you said that I was smart. I don't think that I am particularly smart. You I just think that I have, no, smart. I've met genuinely smart people. What yeah, I, but what's the scale? What's the spectrum? What's the, what, you know, what's the yeah. context of smart? You're well, smart. No, I just think I have a capacity for being able to like make an idea easier to understand. I think that's really or or comedically easier to understand. And that's incredible. That's way more powerful than sitting away somewhere in a room writing things that no one else will understand or read. It's an incredible skill. It's funny when I was doing the book because they they were like, do any of these people have names or are you going to describe what any of them look like? And I was like, no. I was like, no. And that that is on purpose because my story, the book and the, the, the show, they're both a story. Everything mm. in them is true that happened, but none of it is true to the actual person or that because I didn't want it to be about the person. So yeah. when I tell the story of the plumber fixing the washing machine, it's actually three different incidents, one with a plumber, two others with other tradies that I've combined into this like, you know, character that could not be identified by any of them as being them because I, the last thing that I would hate is anyone mm. to read, oh, I was the person who said that anti-vaccine to him. You weren't. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I, that, that character, that old lady oh, that yeah. I'm talking about is actually two blokes a combo. and a young yeah. woman <laughs> that I've combined into an old I lady do that all the time, in some of Voltron course. style, you know. Yeah, yeah, good, like, good. It's about not about the person. This isn't mm. me saying... And, like, you know, early on in my comedy career, you know, like your political satire was like John Howard looks like Mr Sheen, whereas like now and for a very long time it's been like say something about what they're saying. Don't say something about how they look, you know. Barnaby Joyce, there's plenty of things that you can criticise Barnaby yeah. Joyce about r- rather than the colour of his skin, you know what I mean? Mm. Like there's just things You play that... the ball, not the man, Will. Yeah. Sporting analogy. Thank you, Em. Yes. Good. Yeah, that's of course. Yeah, you don't, you're right. You don't make fun of people. You, you make fun of what, you know, what well, they're I saying. Well, I think you're allowed to say that things are bad ideas or that you think they're bad 100%. ideas or try to call through the bullshit. In fact, yeah. I kind of feel like that is the job. Absolutely. It is. And you're doing it. I am going to let you go because I've had you for way too long. <laughs> it was fun though. I, oh, I love, I could honestly sit and talk. We I don't know. do we it enough. We barely got started to be honest. We, we just don't do it started. enough. Yeah. I know. I'm Not Fine Thanks is available 1st of November at all good bookstores. The cover art is beautiful. Who did it? James Fosdyke who does all my original artwork. Yeah, it's my head sort of exploding and coming apart. My favourite bit though is there's like a giant snake that like weaves around the head because of course James is brilliant and incorporates mm. all these like things from the book. Like if you look at the cover there's all these themes that will come up in the book he's a genius and then at the last minute I just didn't really like the snake chapter and I cut it but it was too late to change the art so <laughs> it's just a giant snake there for no reason well you know it could stand for anything who yeah, knows exactly. what is it is it the industry Imagery, around mate. his neck yeah, exactly <laughs> and question everything uh, Wednesday nights 8 30 ABC TV and ABC iView Will Anderson I love you very much I love your brain I'm glad you exist uh, please keep making stuff I love you too I'll talk to you soon thanks Will Boy. All right, well, thanks for being here. Don't forget, grab a copy of Will's book, I'm Not Fine Thanks, on the 1st of November and check him out with Jan Fran Wednesday nights, 8.30pm on the ABC. We'll be back Thursday, as always, with another episode of Emsolation with Michael Lucas and my daughter Marcella. If you like this episode, please share it. Please tell a friend. It's so great to be able to be making these type of things, you know. just keeps me ticking over, keeps my brain going, especially when I get to talk to people like Will And next week we have an extra special guest. I won't tell you too much now, but she is starring in the current remake of Heartbreak High and she's my favourite character. (gasps) I've said too much. All right, gang. See you soon. Free Time Tuesday on Emsolation is a Spotify exclusive podcast hosted and produced by M. Rossiano. Recorded and edited at Down the Hill Studios by Ezekiel Fenn. A brand new episode of Emsolation with M. Rossiano drops every Thursday, 6am, only on Spotify.